where God is this morning. Let every light be silenced and all depression cease. Let every dark assignment bow down at Jesus' feet. Let every curse be broken. Let every storm be tamed. And all that comes against us be bound in Jesus' name. Your presence is my greatest weapon. Pushing back the darkness. Breaking every chain. Opens up the heavens, crushing every stronghold when I speak your name. Cause your presence is my weapon. Your presence is my
Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. But the cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. That sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of that silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me let's sing that out again then came the morning that sealed the promise
I don't know who that was preaching, but he has set an unfair bar for me this morning. Amen. I am not going to clear that. I'll just put that out there right now, but I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and it is great, uh, great to be with you all this morning. Great to be with anyone that's worshiping at home or back in the overflow rooms. Uh, it's just a real pleasure to be with everybody this morning. Um, I'm going to say a really quick prayer before we get in here. Uh, we lost uh, last Saturday uh, Gene Nisley, who has been a part of this church for a very, very long time. I know we mentioned that last Sunday. We were able to celebrate his life this Friday here at the church, this past Friday. Uh, I just want to say a quick prayer for his family, continue to keep them uh, in our thoughts. They've um, gone through a heck of a lot in the last five or six years. And, and so if you know the Nisleys or not, we're going to lift them up in prayer and then just lift up this morning in prayer. Really excited for what God is doing here this morning. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? God, we, uh, we lift up before you the Nisleys, Barb, and, and Greg, and Rod, and their children, and, and just ask that you would uh, surround them, and support them, and cover them as they, they mourn the passing of Jean, um, as they, you know, once again, kind of figure out what it means to move forward um, through loss. Um, we just pray that your love would surround them, and, and they would know your support, they would know the support of their church family um, in the weeks to come. Pray for all of us as we're uh, facing down, you know, a, a lot of different things um, presently and in the coming weeks, and that this uh, sermon would be your words to us. It would be words of, of challenge and also of encouragement, um, helping us to discern um, the times and what you would have us be doing. So we, we praise you, Jesus, that, that some things uh, do not ever change, and that we can continue to come back to your word and continue to come back and rest in who you are and who you've called us to be those of us that are your followers. So thank you, Jesus, for your love, and uh, bless us this morning. Amen. So last Sunday, we began to discuss uh, what Jesus meant when he comes on the scene at the beginning of the Gospels and declares, the kingdom of God is at hand, he says, is in our midst. We talked about the fact that when he said that, he was not declaring a physical kingdom, but that the kingdom of God was the reign and the rule of God, what was, was his reign in our lives and in his church. We said that the kingdom of God exists wherever Jesus reigns, wherever humans are living consciously under his authority and how he has called them to act. That is where the kingdom of God is. So if we care about the kingdom of God, if we want to see that on earth as in heaven, then it's imperative that as followers of Jesus, we have to understand ourselves first and foremost as citizens of that kingdom and let that shape everything else about our lives, everything, including our approach to politics. So we looked at a few of the many things Jesus says about the kingdom of God in the Gospels, um, and we kind of distilled from those things a couple kingdom values, so-called, that could help guide our attitude and guide our actions in this time. Three of many. We're going to do four more today. It's not at all a comprehensive list. Jesus says a lot of things about the kingdom of God, but, but we're going to hit a couple of them. Last Sunday, we, we talked about these three kingdom values. First, that in Jesus' kingdom, we value bottom-up change, not top-down change. Also, in Jesus' kingdom, we put the S after the apostrophe in Jesus's, but, oh, except in this slide, which we don't, so keep you on your toes. Literally, as I was speaking, I made a fool of myself. In Jesus' kingdom, we exhibit a special concern for the vulnerable, whoever they are, wherever they are. In Jesus' kingdom, we don't limit ourselves to the world's political options, to A, B, right, left, Republican, Democrat. We're not, the kingdom transcends that. We don't have to settle for what the world offers us, but we, we, we set our sights higher. This week, we are going to add four more, not a comprehensive list, not by a long shot, but it's a start, and, and it's a way for us to practice starting with Scripture starting with our eyes on the kingdom and working our way down from there, practicing discernment and, and, and posing the question at least of what does this all mean as we engage with politics in this time. Um, many of those questions will be left for you to answer, but we're going to talk about what is the Bible saying to us clearly on some of these things. As again, uh, I'll mention, as Journey mentioned, Immediately after this service, we are going to have an open town hall kind of discussion thing from 12 to 1. So I'd invite you to stay and uh, ask questions about the series or, or listen to other people ask questions about the series, about what's going on in our world, read politics and culture, and, and how we're navigating that as a church. Just a time to open up the conversation. There's so much going on, and we just think it's so imperative as a church right now that we talk <laughs> um, and try to do that and give opportunities for that. So... I invite you to stay after for that. It'll start immediately after, right in here. Um, yeah, let's dig in. 
uh, and kick off just by laying out our fourth kingdom value right off the top. In Jesus' kingdom, we act with love towards those who mistreat us. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, chapters 5 to 7 is, is the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 38, Jesus lays out some of the most challenging teachings that he ever laid out. First, he says this. He starts by saying, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This was an Old Testament teaching that in its original context basically meant the punishment should fit the crime. (laughs) Prior to this, it was like leg for an eye or death for an eye. People are like, this guy scuffed my shoe. I'm going to push him off a cliff type of thing. That was justice in the ancient world. So eye for an eye was, was an update. It said punishment should fit the crime. By the time you get to Jesus' day, people had started using this differently. They were saying eye for an eye as saying this person did this to me. I am therefore justified in retaliating. Different kind of spirit to how they were applying that. Probably how we more likely use eye for an eye today. Into that... Jesus responds to this popular saying by saying, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. We use the phrase, turn the other cheek, right? We use that phrase as well. And I think we tend to use it as a way of saying, um, you know, ignore something or or ignore offense, look the other way. It's notable that, that when Jesus says it, he literally means... Offer them the other cheek as well, he says, right? So turn the other cheek means, hey, you slapped this one. Now slap this one. (laughs) Give me an even pair. Opening yourself up to more offense. He goes on. He says, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well, which is just a crazy thing. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. So in the Roman world, Roman soldiers, if they were traveling along these Roman roads, They could compel anyone they come across to carry their gear for them, carry whatever kit they have, whatever armor they have, whatever. You could, they could compel anyone to carry that up to and only up to one mile. If you refuse them, you could be beaten and flogged. So Jesus says to his Jewish audience, hey, if a Roman asks you to carry their stuff, mind you, a Roman, a member of this hostile occupying empire that is oppressing your people, If he asks that of you, go two miles instead. Go double the required maximum. Puts a different light on go the extra mile, right? We tend to think of that as like applying ourselves really hard at our job and maybe we'll get a better Christmas bonus. That's not quite what Jesus is talking about, right? Very different. And Jesus puts the cherry on top when he says, you have heard it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, we hear these words all the time and I think they just wash over us, but but Jesus says to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. It's worth noting here for the record that love your neighbor is from the Old Testament. That's from Leviticus 19. Hate your enemies is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. This phrase that Jesus is saying is half scripture, half other stuff that people have started putting into scripture. It does not say hate your enemy anywhere. I think hating our enemies is something that still creeps into our thinking today and feels justified. I think very few of us set out to hate anyone, but I think this is what happens. We start with a disagreement, maybe in this case a political disagreement. And sometimes that disagreement could give way to some fear or some sense of opposition, that that this person or this party is an existential threat to our country. We wouldn't survive another four years of this person, or we wouldn't survive four years of that person. If, If these people stay in power, if these people come into power, it's over for America, we start to think. And disagreement turns to fear, turns to this kind of win at any cost mentality that can slip into hatred for that enemy which I'm putting in quotes. We forget that they are human. We forget they are a child of God. They simply become a threat to us. And so we are justified in hating them. That's what I see playing out through across our culture. If Jesus commands us to love our enemy, if we know that in Jesus' kingdom we should show love, act in love towards those who mistreat us, What does that mean? What does that look like for us? What would it look like to go the second mile? 
Go above and beyond in serving the person who is oppressing you. The person who is destroying your way of life. What does it mean to go the second mile for that person? What does it mean to, what does it look like for you to pray for those who persecute you? To sincerely pray for the person threatening you, impinging on you, seeking to harm you. Pray for that person. It's easy to let that roll over us. It sounds nice what Jesus is saying. What is, think about that when the rubber meets the road to sit down and pray for that person that you're feel for, fearful of, that has wronged you. Do that, and you will be like your Father in heaven, who has patience and grace even for those that he judges. And you will be like Jesus, who looks down from the cross and forgives people that are wrongly torturing and killing him. Amen? In that, you may continue to harbor reservations or strong t critique for this or that political party or movement, you may even have fear, but in those moments, hold that disagreement. It's understandable, but do not give way to hate in that. Do not let yourself hate, but try. Take a small baby step in cultivating a heart of love for that person, whatever that looks like. Next value this morning. When Jesus comes preaching his kingdom, he primarily targets his ministry at the Jewish people. Yet even throughout that ministry, we start to see hints that the gospel might extend beyond the Jewish people in the love he shows to Samaritans, who are the cultural enemies of the Jewish people, and in so many other ways. Uh, with the woman that they're ready to stone, it just becomes clear that, that the good news is for more people than we think, that the good news is for everyone. Before leaving his disciples, uh, he commands them, in fact, to say, go and make disciples of all nations. And this begins to happen immediately after Jesus' departure. Well, 50 days after Jesus' departure at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, we have all these Jewish people coming together for this festival of Pentecost. Um, and, and, and they gather together and the disciples are there preaching. And, and the disciples preach in Greek, probably, is what they're speaking in at that time. Preaching the message that Jesus Christ died and is risen again and ascended to heaven, preaching this. As they're saying this in Greek, all the people hear them speaking in their own languages. we got people from every region, from all the surrounding countries, from up through Asia Minor and down everywhere, and they hear, him spe hear these guys speaking in their native tongue and then carry this message back to their homelands. The very beginning of the church, the explosion of the church here in Jerusalem is marked by the good news going beyond the bounds of any one nation, any one people. And I think this beautiful scene at Pentecost, as well as so much else in the New Testament, gives this picture of, of our next kingdom value, which is this. In Jesus' kingdom, we believe that true diversity is both possible and needed. And when I say diversity, I mean diversity of all kinds. It's not limited to racial, racial diversity, which is where our minds go, but it definitely includes that. We see this in so many ways. We see this at Pentecost with the Jews from all these different nations coming together and worshiping together and hearing the gospel in their own languages. We see this in Jesus' disciples, right? One of his disciples is a tax collector who works for the Romans, has sold out his own people to the Romans. Another one of Jesus' disciples was a zealot whose goal was to overthrow the Romans. If we think Thanksgiving is tense at our house, imagine sitting down at the Last Supper with these two guys. The zealots over here are like, Jesus, are you sure that we're not going to violently overthrow the Romans? Have we, have we ruled that out yet? Like, imagine that conversation. Throughout the book of Acts, we see the gospel proceeding out, breaking down barriers faster than the disciples can even keep up with. The Holy Spirit is a step ahead of them all throughout the book of Acts. The gospel is going out to Romans and, and, and centurions and Ethiopians and, and Gentile pagans and everybody. And in that progression and throughout the New Testament, we see that God has purposefully designed his church to be a, a truly diverse thing. And that diversity is made possible because those different cultures, those political persuasions, those ethnicities, they can be bound under one king. They can be united in the gospel. In Galatians 3, Paul says this. He says, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. 
For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, have put on Christ, have been clothed in Christ. Your primary identity now is in Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When we meet at the cross, when our first loyalties belong to Jesus above all else, real unity is made possible. A unity that also preserves diversity. We learn from Paul's teachings about the body, that the body is made up of many parts, many different members, and we don't need a body that's all feet or all ears. We need this diversity of people and giftings to function as the church, even as that diversity is united under one head, who is Jesus. Amen? We see this with our preaching team. Those of us on the preaching team are coming from a variety of different political perspectives, and that has really shaped this teaching series. This sermon, any of the sermons we're preaching are not a product of my thoughts, someone else's thoughts. We are all speaking into this because we know that for God to lead us through these next couple months is going to require us to all be speaking into this. It also means that if you are really bothered by any part of this sermon, it probably Ted wrote it. So... (laughs) Anyway, um, Ted can take that. None of us could get up here and faithfully lead forward in what God wants his church to be if we were coming from only one perspective. We are informed by that diversity, and we need it. The church is built on it. So what does that mean for us? That means three things. First, uh, it means, again, our unity is rooted in Jesus' kingship. It is on those grounds and those grounds alone that we bridge the differences between us. And this is, I'm talking about the church here. Whereas rooting our identities primarily in our politics, in our cultural heritage, or in our race, that is not the pathway to unity. At the same time, we seek a diverse unity. Even as we seek unity, we don't want to paper over our differences because we believe those are gifts. We believe God has created it to be that way. From a racial perspective, we don't want to be colorblind. From a socioeconomic perspective, we don't want to be collarblind. Anyone? Blue collar, white collar? Watch the office? Never mind. We'll keep moving. Thank you. We want to be intergenerational, we want to be politically diverse, we want to be racially diverse, at least to the degree that we can reflect the community we live in and our surrounding communities, amen? We think that many of our differences are gifts from God that should be cherished and celebrated and they are needed in this church, in every church, if we are to be who God has called us to be, amen? Thirdly, we aren't afraid to acknowledge our failures at this. Listen, you'd be surprised how much of the New Testament is devoted to solving the problem of how the heck Jews and Gentiles are supposed to get along in the church. They had a lot of trouble figuring out how to do that. And they knew Jesus. So we are going to struggle with this. And it's fine to admit that. The natural inclination for groups of humans anywhere, in the church or otherwise, is to drift towards towards sameness, right? Right? towards all becoming kind of conformed to this political culture or that political culture, to this age bracket, to this racial demographic. We have to consciously swim against that tide, and I believe that's the calling of the church to do that. And we don't need to be afraid to acknowledge when we fail at that. We're going to fail at that. But that's the mission. That's the calling. And so we can have a posture of openness rather than defensiveness to the ways we have fallen short of God's vision of diversity and equity and unity. We're not going to get it right, but we are commanded to try, and we will. In closing this section, I'll simply say, if that's our attitude in the church, the question I'll pose to you and and leave you with is, is how much should that attitude carry over into our politics, into our engagement with the broader culture? I don't know the answer to that. That's a tough one to, like, apply. I know what's true for the kingdom. I know it's true for the church. But, you know, what, what would it look like for Americans to center their identities as children of God first? And their other identity is second. What would it mean to seek unity while also celebrating diversity? What would it mean to, for, for our whole culture to be willing to acknowledge that the humility to acknowledge when we have failed to be just or equitable or, or united? There's no fear and shame in doing that. I don't know what that looks like applied to our culture, and I'll leave that with you and move on to our next value. In, in Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, God says, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, 
that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. There's about three or four sermons in there, but we're just going to go with one of them for today. God delights in love, in justice, and righteousness. In, in Jesus' kingdom, we too delight in justice as God delights in justice. We delight in biblically rooted justice. We know from the whole witness of Scripture that in Jesus' society, things are going to be perfectly just. One day they will be. This, this sermon series is called Kingdom Come, and we look forward to this coming kingdom and know that one day when Jesus returns and only then, only when he is reigning here in the flesh physically, things will be perfectly just, and we look forward to that day. I look forward to that day and long for it. When Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom, the last will be first, the lowly will be raised up, nobody will have too much or too little, injustices of all kinds will be wiped away, everything will be restored, no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, nothing. Love and truth and justice and righteousness will rule the day when Jesus is king physically here on earth. Amen? So as followers of Jesus who are shaped by Scripture, my prayer is that we would be captured by that vision of God's coming kingdom, God's perfect and just reign, that we would long to see it. And that in keeping it with Jesus' heart, we would delight to see it. We would delight when we see those little glimpses of justice being done this side of eternity. And we would have hearts that mourn when justice is denied. We would follow the command from Romans 12 to mourn with those who mourn. This could mean many, many different things for us this morning, but when we, when we hear cries for justice, my prayer is that inspired by that, division, by that vision, by longing to see the kingdom come on earth as in heaven, that our heart would be God's heart when we hear those cries, that we would approach cries for justice with, with, with an open mind, with an open heart, not a spirit of defensiveness or dismissal but a spirit that delights in what God delights in. If our contemporary world is any indication, there's going to be staunch disagreement about so many things, about the problems on the ground, about uh, what the solutions ought to be for those things, and we acknowledge that. But over all of that, our first response as followers of Jesus, when we hear cries for justice, should be to be people that delight in it delight in seeing justice done, that we mourn injustice, that carry ourselves with grace and compassion and openness to those cries, because that is God's heart. And he shows us that up and down the Bible to see justice done first among his people, the church, and also ultimately for the world. And so may we proceed with discernment about figuring out what all that means in our contemporary culture, but may we first focus on cultivating God's heart in us. One final value. In Matthew 6, Jesus exhorts his hearers not to worry about their food, about their clothing, about whatever tomorrow will bring, but instead to trust that God will provide. And he finishes by saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So our last value this morning is that in Jesus' kingdom, we face the future without fear. Amen? If Jesus is really king of everything we see, if our lives are really and truly submitted to his rule, there is no firmer foundation possible than that, right? We can lay claims to those promises from Romans chapter 8 that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. How would our lives change if we started there? How would our engagement with politics change if we started there? How would our engagement with our enemies change if we started there? With that as our foundation, what could we not face before us? In the Gospels, when Jesus sends out his disciples on like a solo ministry trip, he says to them, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Jesus, always great with the pep talk. And he proceeds to basically instill in them as they're walking out the door this expectation like you will face persecution. And trial. He says, if they've treated me this way, says Jesus, imagine how they will treat you. 
And he instructs them on how to face that persecution. In this moment, we are facing, as Christians, as Americans, we are facing a lot, right? Like a lot, a lot. You feel that. So many things that I don't need to say because you know. And, and I'm not sure how much this helps in this moment, but, but hardship, persecution, societal breakdown, hatred of followers of Jesus, hatred all around, these have always been part of the deal. That doesn't, it's not super encouraging to hear that, but <laughs> it's how Jesus sent people out. It, just, it, it's, it is what it is. And even in that, he reminds them as he goes on in that passage, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He goes on to say that the very hairs of your head are numbered. God, the one we should truly fear. Hear that. This is kind of paradoxical. Like, fear him who can destroy your body and soul in hell has numbered the hairs on your head. The person, the, the, the only person who holds your life in their hands is God. And that should instill a certain degree of, like, uh, fear, I guess. But, but also, immediately followed up that that person who holds your life in his hand has counted every follicle on your head. For John, that took about six seconds. But for some of us, it's... Sorry. It's good to see you, man. Hi. I'm about five years behind you. He has... God holds our lives in his hands. Holds my life in his hands. He's known before I knew, when I had dreams of flowing locks, that this is what I was going to be dealing with. He knows everything about us, down to every atom. He is watching over us, the God of the universe. So in the face of political chaos, a contentious election, injustice, civil unrest, and, and oh yeah, that ongoing pandemic thing, even in the face of all that, God says, like, why worry? Seriously. Why worry? Do you know who I am, says God? Fear me and fear me alone, knowing that I have never taken my eyes off you for a second, not one time, and I never will, and nothing can separate God and his love in Christ Jesus from you. Nothing. Nothing that happens over the coming months can separate you from that. No election, no legislation, nothing can stop the kingdom of God. Pandemic and political turmoil and persecution, none of that can turn aside what God has purposed to do in our midst. Amen? None of it. As the song says, as the passage says, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he is watching us as well. The king of everything who died for us, is watching over you even now. And if you could get a grasp of that truth, wouldn't that put so much of the modern moment in perspective? We would be able to face the future without fear, truly. All these things that feel so weighty, so intense, so existentially threatening, in the view of eternity, these are blips on the radar of what God is doing in the world. They're nothing. His word shall stand. His, his church, hear me, church, the church shall stand. Even if it's persecuted, it will come out the other side of that persecution, refined by fire, more beautiful and glorifying God more than it ever had. Amen? Amen. So what are we worried about? And I say that to you as someone who is pretty worried. This last value has come to my mind six or seven times just in the last 24 hours. And I'm reminded, it's always a humbling thing to be like, remember that you're preaching that tomorrow, Ryan? Maybe you should like stop for a second and for once, think about what you're preaching and like apply it to yourself. That'd be a good idea. Okay, Spirit, I'll do that. I get it. I, I just pray that, that God would make it true for you in your heart. The challenge that I'm going to leave you with is, is simply that, is that you would reflect on these seven kingdom values that we've laid out and, and find more. Go to the Gospels. Um, distill more. What does God say about his kingdom? What is God trying to teach us and how is he trying to shape us in this moment? We need, we need, need, need to be diligent right now. There's so many other things calling for our attention, our allegiance, so many other things we could root ourselves in right now. We need to be rooted in scripture. So take these seven values. They're in the app. We'll post them on Facebook later as well. They're all there. Um, reflect on them in the days and weeks to come. See how God wants to speak to you in those and be rooted in those. And I pray that you would leave this morning encouraged. 
knowing that's what, what, what's happening right now in our world, it, it, it's important. It's, it's worth our time and concern, and it, it, I'm struggling too. I don't know what's coming. But we have to get our eyes up. We have to begin to understand and remember that the kingdom of God truly transcends what's happening, that we worship and serve a Jesus who, who, who reigns over an unshakable kingdom. And if we get straight on who he is, really, if we can get straight on that, that truth alone will reshape our lives. I pray that that would happen for us. Would you pray with me? God, it's... Um, it's a blessing and, a, and something we're so thankful for to know that whatever else is happening in the world, whatever else we are facing, um, we can come here and worship you. We can rest in the fact that you are unchanging. Yesterday and today and forever, you are the same. We can praise you. Even when we don't see your, your hand in our lives, even when we don't understand what you're doing, can't make sense of all the moving pieces around us and what's around the corner, and we don't have that sense of your presence with us. It's a beautiful thing that we can come together and worship anyways. And I pray that you would make yourself known, you would make your presence clear to us this week, today, in the next 10 minutes, that your spirit would move and comfort us, challenge us, shape us, equip us to be who we need to be and do what we need to do in the coming weeks. May we all just submit ourselves to your rule in our lives, whatever that means. It's a scary thing to do. But, but we, I, I want us all to put ourselves before Jesus and just say, you are king here. And help us be obedient to follow out whatever means from that. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. a song um, about all this stuff. I'm known to do that from time to time. Uh, I hope it blesses you. Just passing in the dark Opposition learn to listen It's an agent of But there's a kingdom mission Kingdom vision Larger than our spark He is justice For the poor and weak He is free he is liberty He's the answer He's the clue it's Hallelujah Hallelujah Everybody has a history Shapes their point Maybe all these stories are refining me and you. There's conviction, and there's devotion, and there's a line too far, but there's no additives to Jesus. He alone can change your heart. Cause he is justice for the poor and weak. He is freedom, He is liberty, He's the answer, He's the good, so hallelujah, hallelujah. It's your brother, your resentment. 
your saves to you despise Learn to love in disagreement Look them in the eyes Them human eyes Simon, Peter, and Matthew, Levi, Mary, Magdalene Lady of the night, a bureaucrat and a charlatan, and a Jesus, and a witness, and a Holy Ghost, and from their martyrdom, the church unites and fills the enemy. Yes, and he is just a for the poor and weak He is freedom Yes, He's liberty He's the answer He's the glue Sing hallelujah Hallelujah Sing hallelujah you all to know, I want you to hear me say at least uh, I feel all this very intently just like you do. Um, temperature in the air is so contentious all the time now in our lives and there's so many reasons uh, that that's pressing in on us and um, finding the wisdom in that is just really, really challenging and finding even the, the love in your heart and the parse out all the challenges in that is so hard. But I know this will, I know as believers in Jesus, this will stir you. We as a church are called to do the hard things, aren't we? You know, there's just things that are not easy, and this is one of them, and yet the church must look different. And uh, Jesus did some uneasy things for us. Uh, this, this challenge is before us, and I hope that we meet it, because if you think about how that light will shine, um, it's pretty exciting um, in the midst of uh, all the chaos, if we can be lovers of each other and really, really love each other like Jesus did somehow through all this would be powerful. These words, I know you know them, and I think they're, they're about as perfect the words to sing right now as I can think of. So please join us. I have decided to follow Jesus
no turning back no turning back no turning back wow i know i've been challenged this morning but i'm also encouraged because i can i can imagine what it might be like if if we would all reflect those kingdom values. And so I just wanted to remind you of Ryan's challenge this morning. And and that's to uh, commit to reflecting daily to those seven kingdom values that we talked about. And and even adding your own, even searching the gospels and seeing what, what Jesus teaches us about the kingdom of God. As you prepare to leave this morning, don't forget about our drop boxes, our offering drop boxes in the, uh, the, through the double doors as you leave. Don't forget that over here, if you're in need of prayer, to my left, there's a prayer banner and someone would love the opportunity to pray with you. And lastly, right here in this room, in a few minutes, we're gonna have our open forum town hall. So stick around, hang out. We'd love to have that conversation with you. Have a great week. So we follow. Decided to follow Jesus.